Generic greetings and welcome to Science Insanity, a show dedicated to bringing my love of science fiction in all its splendid brilliance to you. And along for the ride, filling in the role of the science illiterate and comedic relief is Steve. Say hello. Hello. He is more entertaining than this, I promise. Today, we are talking about Armored Core, the general world, the mechs, the mercenary mindset, and of course, the never-ending corporate wars over who gets to define what's humane and reasonable working conditions. But before we get into that, shameless shill. If you'd like to support Science Insanity and gain access to all of our content a day early, then check out our Patreon, buy me a coffee, or become one of the food merchants feeding Steve. And if space bucks are short, then check out the rest of our content, like, sub, ring the bell, and all of that, since every little bit helps. I've been told if, uh, if I get fed more, my portion won't get deleted anymore. Oh my god. <laughs> Did you have to- we discussed that before the recording even. Come on! I told you, I'm still kicking myself in the nuts about that. I'm so mad. because my performance wasn't good enough. Ugh. I'm going to I'm going to strangle you through the screen. I'm going to when your food gets here, I'm going to reach through the screen. I'm going to slap it out of your hand. <laughs> okay. Oh, anyways, and with that, I have a question for you, Steve. Are you ready to delve into an awful world ruled by dystopian mega corporations and filled with unimaginable suffering, death, corruption, and plagued by automation, rogue AI, and corrupted computer systems, all the while even the escape of death has been stolen from you? No. Why do you keep doing this to me? I was firmly <laughs> expecting you to say yes. I, yeah, I literally- right. There was an Amazon joke about that as well. I was gonna be like, oh, nice, Amazon's hiring after the latest round of layoffs and union busting. Ha ha ha, funny <laughs> laughing. And you just- Man, <laughs> you are You are the definition of the other person doesn't know what I'm gonna do if I don't know what I'm gonna do. It's fucking impossible to predict, predict you. Every single time I try to do something, it's just like, nope, you do the opposite. And then I You're do, and I, I, I play into that, and then you do the other thing. It's amazing. You're welcome. Always, you never let them know your next move. Firstly, we need to establish something about the actual setting. The lore and world of this series is an absolute mess. It's like Final Fantasy. There are so many different games and universes and timelines and alternate perspectives on stories that it's just absolute chaos. If I am remembering this correctly, there are 13 mainline games, many of which do not, in fact, continue the same story, seven spin-offs, which range from great to awful and are tie-ins or complete standalone, and three remasters with Fires of Rubicon or Armored Core 6. I think there's like 24 games or something. And there are four main timelines and several standalone offshoots, like I said, that all have the same or similar backgrounds, but are not... The same, or it's, it, it's, it's a nightmare, it's awful. So, for all the viewers hoping that I will be covering the story of every Armored Core, uh, no, no, yeah, get, absolutely not. We don't have like 40 hours to commit to that. Instead, here's a, a quick breakdown of what we're going to do. We're going to be covering the generic setting and lore of Armored Core, the overarching themes and plot points, and we're going to hit a few other bits and bobs for the story here and there. I'm going to munch together just so many different games to make one coherent timeline to talk about. Keep in mind, like I said, I will be munching many different things into a single video rather than making everything all standalone. All the Armored Core games and rebooted timelines have a lot in common and acknowledge each other with a wink and a nod. So I'm just going to string them together for a fan and explanation of the lore and you can't stop me. Also, if you're going to complain about misrepresenting your favorite character, Glup Shido, and his famous Armored Core Sigma 7 2069, then just don't. Save everyone the effort and just enjoy what's on offer, please. I beg you. Do please comment, but don't feel like you're going to get acknowledged or anything. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That's a, that's a better response. My goal is to give you an idiot's guide to Armored Core and catch you up on the themes and stuff. And I needed this absolute monstrous introduction because this is going to be an absolutely monstrous video. So, after like, what, 10 minutes we can finally start? Armored Core, like I said, this series is... Not a particularly nice universe to live in. To put it mildly, things have gone to shit in so many different ways, mankind may as well be swimming in a septic tank. 
Humanity in Armored Core, much like in 40k or Battletech, is suffering a current Dark Age. Technological regression and loss of former glory is a constant after some of the most cataclysmic conflict ever seen by mankind. So terrible was the fighting that, most likely full of nukes and other superweapons, that the world was left utterly devastated, the majority of human technology lost, most of mankind dead, and the societies and governments of old all but gone and forgotten. It is not a great time to be alive. I don't know, man. It sounds like it could be. Oh, even for the heroes and the main characters and the mercenaries, believe you me, it is it is not a fun life to live. We are going to talk about what caused all of this, though, because it's quite interesting. I should also say, this is a From Software IP, meaning the style of storytelling is a punch in the teeth, a laugh from Miyazaki, and a bunch of half-burned images, books, and item descriptions spread across the game. It's great. I love it. So there might be some inaccuracies or some skimming here, but that's just because it's relatively vague and nebulous and everybody gets to kind of decide what's important for themselves. What we know about the defining part of Armored Core's past, the significant event that most of the main games are based off of, was the Thirty Years' War. While little is known about this conflict, there are several notable fragments of information from before the conflict that have survived. Anything surviving from before the conflict is considered so rare, important, and defining that as a whole, they often become the final centerpiece for, like, the entire story. Lost and forgotten weapons, technology, data banks, and even, like, entire buildings that survived and have important shit in them are often the cause of new wars breaking out over control of them and whatever power or secrets they might hold. Over the Thirty Years' War, however, was a slow escalation into Armageddon, spawned by greed, poverty, and crippling resource shortages. How crippling are we talking here? We're talking about like FDR crippling or uh... No 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 no. I'm talking like Waffle House is out of business crippling. Like they, they can't operate no more. It's over, man. The M the end times are here. Like I said, munching the lore of AC timelines here. Before the Armored Cores, before all of this, mankind was in a technological golden age. Science and learning were ascendant. Corporations and governments wielded more power and authority than ever in human history, and the divide between the rich and the poor was a chasm bigger than the Grand Canyon. It was around this time that the resource shortages really began to make their effects felt. Despite that, the governments of the world held the lid on this pot and prevented it from boiling over fully, until big business and mega corporations stabbed them in the back. What a surprise. <clears throat> yeah, take a wild guess what happened. Uh, Amazon uh, said, fuck you, no breaks, and uh, everyone was not happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I mean... <laughs> Do Amazon employees even get breaks anyways? Wasn't there that guy that literally had a heart attack and died in a, fa in a warehouse and just no one noticed for like an hour? For decades, perhaps like centuries by this point, mega corporations spanning the globe had become more powerful than nations, in some cases literally subsuming them and turning them into industrial or economic bases to support the corporations rather than actual nation states. These megacorps had also become the primary supplier and developer of basically everything, from appliances and food to nukes and mechs. If you're familiar with the Mechanicus from 40k, basically that. They also maintained large standing militaries to protect their assets from the ravages of social unrest and AWOL military warlords. They weren't called militaries, quote unquote, that would have been a little bit of a no-no and two on the nose. But through shell companies, mercenary organizations, and private security contractors, these mega corporations had amassed a combined military that could rival or exceed the capability of the world's standing forces. And guess where this is going? Uh, war. Yes. Although the scale of it is a little bit hilarious. The megacorps used these forces to commit the greatest coup in human history. They stunned the world by launching a coordinated assault on. Well, pretty much everything everywhere all at once. Entire armies of the most advanced armored cores and weapons swarmed across the beleaguered and crumbling husks of once great empires I'm feeling for both today, tearing them down with ease. This became known as the National Dismantlement War, for the result of each world government being literally taken apart and subsumed into big business. 
By the end, every megacorporation had signed into being the Pax Economica, officially doing away with the fighting each other and focusing on making as much money as possible and nominally keeping humanity alive as their subservient workforce. Unfortunately, it did not work. It never works. The driving force of business is more. So obviously, a government of competing businesses all being built on a foundation of neutral non-infringement of economic sovereignty would, would never work. They immediately started poking and prodding at one another and trying to destroy each other. Because after fighting a world war that lasted a couple weeks, sure, let's just drag it out into another one. That's great for stability and great for peace. Says, uh, Mr. Krabs, what made you do this? Money. <laughs> This quickly spiraled out of control into what was known as the Lynx War, named after a group of mercenaries that were very prominent in it and a series of advancements in mech technology. While it didn't result in the outright destruction of the world's biosphere, it came damn close. Screw Mother Nature. Big business needs to advance and by god nukes are the easiest way to clear a forest for more parking lots. Here we go again. <laughs> A new form of radiation also emerged at this point, named after its pioneer Kojima. This was released en masse due to the conflict, poisoning much of the surface of the world and separating society out into the elite who took two giant airships called Arcs that fly above the suffering and pollution, and the remaining colonies on the surface for everyone else. The conflict was so destructive that the megacorps began to actually dismantle destroy and delete what they had on their armored cores for a couple of reasons. Number one, they feared the power being put in the hands of a single pilot, mostly stemming from lone mercenaries crippling entire armies and military forces single-handedly. That would be the role of the player character in these games, by the way, in case that wasn't obvious. I don't think it was, so... I'm glad you clarified. Yeah, 1v wanting an entire army and having plot armor thicker than multiple battleships. Yeah, that couldn't possibly be anyone else but the player character. Well, it could have been a side character that you just meet randomly along the way. You never know. Instead, they began to replace the armored cores with colossal weapon systems, multi-miles long and hundreds of meters tall. These mountains of metal and guns that rolled or walked or sailed across the world had impossibly large beam weapons or kinetics that could devastate entire cities in rapid succession, and all manner of super weapons built alongside to boot. From here, things get a little fuzzy. While exact details are unknown, a lot can be pieced together from the ruins left on the surface, and more importantly, the places where there are no ruins left. The Thirty Years' War was started at some point after this. Proxy wars, low-intensity conflicts, frozen stalemates and clandestine operations, we see numerous burnt and bombed out husks dotting the surface of the world that bear the telltale signs of gunfire and conventional weapons. So early on in this conflict, it's clear that things were kept relatively restrained. Those giant mile-long mechs, all the super weapons, they kind of took a backseat to more conventional forces. However, as things progressed, second verse same as the first, complex political alliances and world-spanning militaries began to get dragged into the war, and this is where things started becoming apocalyptic. Sites of combat and cities showing the craters and lingering radiation traces that are the hallmarks of nuclear or Kojima energy weapons, the conflict was just spiraling out of control by this point. The culmination of the Thirty Years' War was the use of the aforementioned superweapons. Virtually none of these survived the era of conflict, but they are referenced or mentioned, and the few that did survive were so far out of reach, i.e. all the way up in orbit or buried in some tundra somewhere no one's ever heard of, that they have been functionally forgotten by the survivors. One such weapon was Justice Station. Probably American with the name an orbital weapons platform of unknown power, function, or armament, as the megacorp survivors who reached it didn't fully understand it, only intending to aim it at the competition and push the big red button because what could possibly go wrong? Justice Station is said to be what finally ended the Thirty Years' War. It did so by kicking off Armageddon. It utterly devastated whatever was left of the world. By the end, after Justice Station and presumably any other remaining super weapons were used, the survivors all but abandoned the old moniker of the Thirty Year War. 
Instead, they began to refer to it simply as the Great Destruction. Vast swaths of the world were rendered completely uninhabitable, as radiation and exotic particle pollution would kill even protected people, eating away quite literally at steel and plastics and armor as surely as it would flesh and bone. There are, you see examples of this where the radiation and exotic particles of Kojima uh, radiation and stuff, they get so bad that they literally start melting your armored core when you're in proximity to them. This is like the most advanced armor that humanity has, and it is melting in it contact like with this stuff. It's just skill diffing people. Uh, how, how, how is that a skill difference? It just exists and you die. Yeah, exactly. They, they got skill diffed. Okay, all right. Fair enough. At the same time, monumental storms ripped across the remaining wastelands. The deep deserts that had taken over most of the world and the Arctic hellscapes that populated the North and South Pole and the far barren oceans with like nothing living in them played host to storms and natural weather capable of toppling skyscrapers and suffocating a person due to the wind speed. These areas were only inhabited by extremely sparse research bases, outposts, and the very occasional resource extraction site. The destruction was so horrific, so total, that the few survivors of humanity was forced underground into cramped, hastily constructed megacities built by said megacorps to house themselves and their labor forces deep underground where all of the destruction and the radiation couldn't reach them. The Thirty Year War all but annihilated most of the technology from before. Armored cores were once again built after the technology was lost, but not for fighting initially. They were designed as industrial and construction mechs, able to withstand the surface conditions to do labor or mining. These became known as MTs, muscle tracers, and were basically bigger versions of power armor rather than the height of armored cores mechs. This conflict saw tens of billions of people die over its duration, and the few millions that survived were left essentially cut off from everything that happened in the past. Although, there is a bright spot to it. Remember those rich assholes that took to the sky in giant flying arc ships? Yeah. Yeah, you find the wreckage of a bunch of them scattered around in the later Armored Core games. It's great. They got bodied, which, you know, watching as the ultra-rich get absolutely screwed over is never not entertaining. Died, though? I mean, I'm assuming if you're detonating tons of nuclear warheads and firing super weapons all over the place, flying around in a giant, relatively vulnerable, what amounts to apartment complex, is probably not going to survive that for very long. Did they not leave atmosphere? No, they flew around in atmosphere, in the upper atmosphere, oh. above, like, all the pollution layers and stuff. They didn't go into space. Humanity lost access to space for, like, a hundred years after the conflict. That's they couldn't get back up there. That's pretty good. Uh, I, think, I think you actually, in one Armored Core game, you literally find one of those arcs just completely destroyed on the surface of the planet. And you, like, run it, you fight in the area around it, and it's, like, stuck into the ground. It fell, this is where it impacted, everybody died. Weren't smart enough to avoid it, get fucked, idiots. GG, noobs. It's like Elon Musk going to Mars to get away from climate change. Like, yeah, sure, okay, Elon, have fun over there. You can die on Mars by yourself alone with all of your rich friends who never learned how to cook or clean for themselves. Don't forget to take along your 300 peasants to do your daily <laughs> jobs for you. Oh, no, 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 he, he's simply going to automate everything. He's going to live in a society True. with 90% 90, 90 robots. Don't worry about it. Nothing will go long, <clears throat> wrong, surely. With the rediscovery of the armored cores and the actual technology to build them, as well as several kind of stupid relics from the past wars, which we will talk about way later, ACs were once again developed and built for the battlefield. Mercenaries rose to prominence again as a way for corporations to wage covert war, and everything is still shit. Put on those goggles, Steve. The septic tank public pool hybrid awaits. Waste processing and entertainment. Corporate efficiency, if I've ever heard of it. God, please no. <laughs> We're never getting an Amazon sponsor, by the way. <laughs> I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't take an Amazon sponsor anyways. They're like indie, in, indie game devs are more generous than Amazon is. Get out of here. I don't care for it. If this that That took absolutely forever. And I had to squish like... 10 games together into a non-canon mess to kind of make that work but that is the rough timeline of all the armored core games now i need to restate this again for the people who are undoubtedly ignoring what i said at the beginning because memory go burr this is not full canon there are four separate timelines 
that all happen at different eras in Armored Core, but they all, like, reference each other with a wink and a nod. They're all very linked with each other. They even reference the same events in some cases. So I feel like it's not too much of a stretch to kind of compile them together into one timeline. Everything is okay, then everything goes to shit, the governments become tyrannical, mega corporations take over the world, real life is at like stage three right now, so you know, we're well on track. Then everything goes to shit when multiple wars break out and rebellions, corporations take over, corporations fight another war, the world basically ends, corporations dig underground like mole men, like Fallout Vault style, then all of a sudden, they start fighting again, because humanity has learned nothing, we are dumb, stupid, stinky, smelly apes throwing rocks, and then they start reintroducing all of the old technology that caused the world to go kaboom in the first place, and everything is still terrible. But don't worry, maybe you can become a mech pilot. But if you fail the, uh, tra the traditions and the tryouts, you are going to be forced to pay for that war machine yourself. Have fun being an indentured slave. Get this universe... This... <laughs> this, this, universe, this universe is awful. If you if you boil it down a lot, this universe really does suck for literally everybody except for like the main character and the people at the very top. It, it's truly terrible. Or you just told me that they suffered too. What? <laughs> oh no 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 no. Those those were like the one percenters. Okay, it, it's like the five percent to the one percent. Those are all the people that died in those fancy arcs, right? The the point zero one percent, the very top cream of the crop, right? You're, you're Jeff Bezos's, right? They, they, they're perfectly fine. They already translocated underground to get as far away from the poor people on the surface to begin with. That's why a lot of this stuff was built to begin with. There, there you go, lads. The Science and Sanity patented official unified timeline of Armored Core, excluding Fires of Rubicon, because it's not out yet, and I cannot figure out how to explain how humanity made it to a different solar system with this universe as the base to start with. Magic. If <laughs> magic, pretty much, yeah. It, all humanity should be farming dirt at this point, like just desperately trying to survive. Now, on to other stuff that's actually more entertaining and not just dry lore explaining the background of this world. Mercenaries. The rest of this video will be relatively fast and snappy. Don't worry, we'll, we'll actually have fun. I promise, Steve. The player character. So, there are multiple player characters, canonically different people across all the games, but as silent protagonists, they're never really referred to by name or any defining characteristics. The community has come to collectively call them the Raven, as just the catch-all term for your player character. Speaking of the Raven, there is also a mercenary corporation, conglomeration, whatever, called the Raven's Nest and other such mercenary outfits. Mercs in Armored Core are like the bread and butter of corporate wars in the current era. They're funded by corporations directly through contracts and payment, or indirectly through industry and arms supplies, giving them free toys to kill with. Mercenaries have grown to such popularity for the same reasons that the Megacorps originally phased out the Armored Cores. Each one is a war machine unto itself. Mercenaries, contrary to what a lot of people think who don't really pay attention to anything going on, are kind of like slave soldiers in the Armored Core IP. It's not as glorious as you might think being able to fly around in these giant mechs. The reason is the contracts they have to sign. They didn't read the fine print. Also, typical meatheads plus typical corporate bullshit. <laughs> I mean, it's it's like the fine print is so small, you need like an electron microscope to see it. They they put like a single atom thick line weight on all of that shit. It's the little white, white font that's three pages after the uh, last page. Like I was saying though, the reason that the mercenaries are not a particularly good life is because you are not given an armored core for free. You do not get paid a shitload of money just for fighting and risking your life. You, you do get paid a shitload, but if you fail, you get nothing, not even a partial payday. And you also have to pay all the maintenance and operating costs of the mech yourself, as well as being heavily, heavily in debt to whoever supplied those weapons and equipment to you. This means that if you blow up most of a target facility or army, the corporation who hired you is not going to pay you, because the contract specified you needed to destroy the entire thing, and they can still see an office supply cabinet standing over there, which means you didn't complete the contract, which means they're not going to pay you, which means you are now hundreds of thousands of monies in debt. Congratulations, idiot. 
See, I just simply wouldn't sign a contract like that, but that's just me. Personally, I wouldn't allow that. Well, I mean, if you don't sign the contracts, you don't get paid, you don't go out to fight. That's the only way that this works. Otherwise, you're just running around killing things for no reason, and you have to pay for ammo. And as an American, I'm sure you can understand the pain of ammo prices. <laughs> yes. However, after all of these missions, after everything, which, by the way, in the games, it's very easy to complete the mission successfully and still lose money because you racked up such a high repair and ammo cost, they saddle you with tons of debt, and then with the added debt, they can force you into more difficult missions or force you to undergo experimental procedures and invasive modifications. The never-ending web of contracts, alliances, and employers means often mercenaries will be stabbed in the back as well. It is extremely common for mercenaries to have breakfast one day with friends and co-workers, then get hunted down and murdered the next because they were paid to remove you from the mercenary rankings for being too good at your job. That is the entire plot of multiple games, by the way. What? Yeah, no, that's, that's like... Multiple? I could see one, but multiple? Yeah, no, it's, uh, I, come on, man, there's like 24 games and a whole bunch of remasters. This this has happened multiple times. Uh, in fact, I, I'm just going to go out on a minor hyperbolic limb here. I'm like 90% sure that there is a mission in every single Armored Core game where you are betrayed by people that you've been working with for the majority of the game. I, I don't think there's a single Armored Core game where you're not stabbed in the back by somebody and then you're forced to kill them. I, like, literally every single game, I think that's, like, a, a huge core part of the story and everything. Right. Integral gameplay mechanic. Um. You are simply role-playing the corporate world. This is what it's like to be a businessman. And uh, Miyazaki is screaming his pain through his artwork at his horrible <laughs> lot in life. Being a mercenary in Armored Core is a double-edged sword, with massive wealth and fame and a giant stompy robot and all the chaos and war you can binge on. But on the other side constant betrayal, forceful body modifications, and death. Gratuitous amounts of your own death. And that brings us to the Human Plus program. This is a game mechanic, firstly, which is actually a really cool way to add in, like, an easy mode. It gives you extra toys, basically. Bonus power, a bunch of other stuff to make the game easier, like, changes to mechanics and stuff if you, uh die too much or you get into colossal debt, the game restarts and you get a second go with all your current progress and all the extra toys and stuff, along with double energy, more health, no restrictions on weapons, that kind of stuff, right? I thought you said this was a FromSoft game. Oh no, it's still unbelievably hard and the community consensus is that you're probably going to literally fail the campaign multiple times before you eventually human plus your way to being overpowered okay. enough to actually win. Gotcha, okay. So, so yes, very much still a FromSoft game. Yes, very much still a From Software game. It will kick you in the nuts repeatedly just for fun. In lore, though, the Human Plus program is what happens when you suck at your job. Just like an Amazon employee failing to hit 20 packages sorted and shipped a minute, if you fall behind, they cut your arms off and replace them with a forklift and shelving units, then install a GPS unit in your brain telling you when, where, and how to move things. It's great. The Human Plus program is also an affront to nature because it is vaguely gestured and talked about that it's possible to reverse death. Sort of. They, they bring you back as basically an abomination after doing all of this to you and ship you out to go fight some more because don't forget, those might be your organs in that body of yours, Steve, but you don't have legal rights to them. Those are your parts. <laughs> Th those, those parts may be in you, but they are not yours. They are on loan, and they will be repossessed. The Human Plus program is just insane. And a huge part of it, and what's discussed a little bit in the lore, is that it's not really understood how it works, or even what the technology fully is. It's extremely unstable and strange. Mental instability and outright psychological schizophrenic breakdowns are frequent. Going insane and being put down permanently is surprisingly common. The technology is also sourced from before the Thirty Years' War, so it is extremely old, hundreds of years by this point, and it's more advanced than anything that's ever been seen. Only, it's been as of yet impossible to actually track down any known origin, development process, or creator. Like, you can kind of assume that you, that you know where the engine powering a tank came from, you can kind of trace it back. You're like, oh, okay, this is how it works. 
This is the first thing that was developed on it. You can kind of trace back how it was built. This literally just popped into being. It's like all of a sudden with no research, no development, the United States just had a space force randomly just out of nowhere. came into exi- what, what we did. We kind of just signed it into action one day <laughs> and there it was. But... I, I know. That's what I was referencing. Very strange. The technology just popped up absolutely out of nowhere. And that's because it's not exactly a human invention. A form of artificial intelligence that basically escaped its box and went rogue created it in an effort to eradicate conflict from mankind by creating a sort of hive-minded singularity intelligence. It's a little nebulous on what exactly its plan was or why, but the instability is an effectiveness. Basically, when you are put through the Human Plus program, you become a much, much better soldier for all of the corporate warlords that you're fighting for, but... They don't really understand what's happening, and they don't really understand that they just hooked you up to a singularity-level AI that's probably whispering unbelievable annoyances into your brain at all times, onto the actual armored cores themselves. Armored cores, like we've talked about, are essentially the pinnacle of military technology, carrying heavy armor composites in a variable arsenal of extremely effective weapons alone, wouldn't really make them anything special, since the MTs they're an evolution of already have that, but the stunning speed, mobility, and computer systems it carries allow the Armored Core to perform far and away above its raw stats. This is due to the namesake of, well, Armored Core's Armored Core. The central torso component contains all the electronics and the Armored Core's reactor, and also serves as the hot seat for the pilot. The squishy meat man piloting this thing has to sit there. This developed over time as the MTs had more and more systems bolted onto them. These could have been built up further, however, it just wasn't cost effective. So instead, these corporations figured out that over time, it would be significantly easier to create modular armored MT cores that could have systems built around them rather than trying to build multiple standalone models. This gave rise to the colloquial Cord Muscle Tracer, or CMT, which was eventually, officially, designated as an Armored Core. That was such a word salad. Your average Armored Core has potentially dozens of component categories. However, they're divided up, according to me and my Giga Brain, into six main categories. The core, the legs, the left and right arm, the arm weapons, and the back mounting. The core contains the cockpit, the head, the power plant, electronic warfare, stuff like radars and jammers and mech boosters. It's all the most important stuff because it makes up the majority of the mech's survivability and determines how many parts can actually be mounted to it. Each of those subcomponents can be swapped out for different effects, such as radar tracking incoming missiles or a head that has improved camera functionality or armor. I would also like to say... The whole reason that these mechs have heads is because that's where all, like, the cameras and stuff are, which is really dumb. Just put cameras everywhere? Why Why would you consign them to the mech's head? Just no. staple those things literally everywhere. We gotta go Pacific Rim style, man. Next up is the legs. These come in four types. Standard bipedal mech legs. Everyone's seen them. They're super common. In fact, you know what? Let me find you an image so that potentially you can see what I'm talking about. Boom. There we go. Look at this Chungus. He's huge. That's your regular mech legs right there. Big, stompy, nothing particularly special about them. They're the bog standard. You have reverse bipedal legs, much slimmer. They look like bird legs and their entire gimmick is being incredibly fast and possibly mounting extra boosters to actually fly. They are very weak, they look really stupid, and in my opinion, probably shouldn't exist in the form that they do. Let me let me find you a quick picture of that as well. So if you look in this image, the one in the bottom right, it's got the weird fancy chicken walker legs. They are so spindly, it looks like if you looked at them the wrong way, they would break. They're, uh... Let me put one eye beam down there and said, all right, looks good. Let's go. <laughs> Not Dude, just even it's... for the legs, it's the arms too. <laughs> like, hello. Um, we move on past that into quad legs, which are my personal favorite. They are extra thick. 
The quad legs are slower than all the other types when they're walking around by a shitload. They have less armor on average, and they burn energy like no tomorrow. They're thicker, but they have less armor. Yes, and there's a reason for that I'm going to explain. No. They... <laughs> oh my god. Just a... they... they make up for it by having the most maneuverable and fastest boost glide on the ground, basically glitch sliding around really fast while also jumping higher and more accurately than all the other mech legs. They can basically, like, out-high jump everything else by far and launch themselves into the sky. They are Not also... a good reason. There's more reasons, okay. and they're better. They are also the first type of legs that can fire back-mounted heavy weaponry without needing to come to a complete stop and then crouch. All the bipedal legs are not stable enough to fire like heavy howitzers or missile batteries from their shoulders. In fact, that last image I sent you, you see there's like big missiles and stuff on the back. That one you probably can fire while you're moving, but they're much, much bigger versions of it. You have to actually stop to use them. If you're using quad legs, you can keep zipping around while firing like an entire America's worth of artillery shells and just not even care. That's the biggest gimmick. You can put all the big weapons on it and fire while moving. I don't, I don't, I don't think that always the benefit of the extra armor just me uh okay let me let me get to you some some pictures then here's one. Ooh, look at that guy he has many huge weapons that's pretty impressive i think multiple multiple like a heavy grenade bomb launcher thing it's fantastic that's from the armored core 6 trailer it looks so good literally 12 out of 10 quad legs i love them they're awesome also, uh, you have to keep in you have to keep in mind less armor because they are gimmick legs in a video game, good sir. Please curb your expectations. No, I shall not. You know what? Fine. Screw you. Unmex your mech. There we go. That's the last kind he of legs. He did it to me. He did it to me. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, tank trade. Holy shit! It's the T fourteen. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, stop. <laughs> Ugh. Tank treads, like I was saying. Giga big, massive weight limit, stupid heavy armor with very little mobility and painfully slow speed. That's what I'd like to see. The upsides are that it has extra boosters by default, so you can free up a core slot for more guns, and it turns the game into a DPS check, basically. Look at enemy. Fire at enemy. Don't stop firing at enemy until either you or the enemy is dead. And considering that when you look at the image, this dude is literally like octuple wielding main cannons, I think you're probably going to win with a loadout like that. This is why. This is why I say this is better, because it just is. Fair enough. Moving on to the arms. Each arm has a different loadout depending on what type you're using, but generally the right arm is your main handheld weapon, a large rifle, machine gun, other type of person obliterator, while your left arm is either support if it's a two-handed weapon, or a melee weapon like an energy blade if it's not. Your arms determine how accurate the mech is while aiming, so if you have piddly little noodle arms you are not going to be able to aim well because you're trying to heft around those giant guns. Like we see in the tank mech, again, you could always sacrifice your worthless hands and instead mount gun arms, which is exactly what it sounds like. More guns, bigger guns, potentially the flaming chainsaw of doom. Let me grab the picture there for you. We are going to talk about that later. It's a hilarious weapon. Generally, you just sacrifice the utility of having hands for more weapons, which, you know, is a pretty good trade-off. And lastly, the back mounting. This is essentially the AliExpress of mech components, whatever knockoff part from the other categories you need bolted on back just for you. Want extra power on your fire control system? Slap a booster on that thing. Need some more airtime or energy efficiency? More jets and boosters to keep you flying around. Maybe you're a freedom lover and want howitzers and gatling cannons strapped onto your shoulders and back. Go for it. Wish we could talk about more like how the actual mechs work, but unfortunately... Because this is from software, and this is Armored Core, there is almost no definitive explanation on like how these things work. Unlike in Battletech, where you've got the Mimer that, keep, that moves things around, you can actually break down the fusion engines to see how they work from the art and stuff, the lore goes pretty in-depth there, there is almost nothing about Armored Core. They're giant magic fighting robots that can just wield a building-sized weapon because they feel like it. Hey, we've made our own cannon for the rest of the video. Why stop now? Pretty much, yeah. 
pure willpower. Pure, pure willpower is how they do it. The, the only thing that we do have, though, on briefly how they're controlled is the name of the, like, proto-armored core, the muscle tracer. The designation kind of implies how the pilot would interact with the mech. Maybe they wear, like, a nerve suit or something, and it reads the muscle inputs from the pilot, copying it one-to-one -one in the mech, sort of like a second skin. But we have no idea, and on to something that is significantly more fun, and that we can laugh at. Weapons! We do know a lot about these, but rather than boring you with dumb details, we're gonna nerd out over the dumb and silly parts. So, out of the way fast. Pistols, machine guns, sniper rifles, and assault rifles, they're exactly what it says on the tin. Very large, very scaled up version of a normal infantry weapon that works exactly the same. If you hit a dude with regular 50, B, like 50 BMG round, he now has a golf ball sized hole through his chest. Hit someone with one of the armored core weapons and that man is going to pull a magic trick on you and disappear. Moving on to other more fun stuff though, bazookas and RPGs. Strangely enough, they don't function like they do in real life. You think it would be like a shoulder mounted, extremely fast projectile launcher that would like absolutely destroy anything it hit with like low guidance or dumb fire munitions, but it's not. They're mostly handheld weapons that fire slow as hell missiles that very leisurely head towards their target. They're not in a rush, it has nowhere to be, so why not enjoy the slow roll? He's looking at me menacingly. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I envisioned when you said that. <laughs> I can't unsee the Patrick thing now. Oh, God. I just imagine the Armored Corps sitting there firing the bazookas at you, and you're just watching them slowly roll in like, wow, this is great. God, go. oh, nice. it's My so visual. cursed. It's so cursed. <laughs> Thank you. That was that was brilliant, truly. Next up, we ha I have... I have the, the wiki page in front of me with all the different weapons and it just keeps scrolling. I'm looking at this and realizing that we've already been going for over an hour by this point, and there are like a hundred different weapon categories. I'm done, I screw it. I, I give up, We're, it's pointless, I, I, I give up. Instead, I quit. If you wanna see all the different types of weapons, go check out the wiki yourself. I'm gonna talk about my, my, my three favorite things instead that I have listed all the way at the bottom, okay? So, the ultimate weapons from Armored Core 4, I think? the Pile Driver from Fires of Rubicon trailer, and the Almighty Kojima Cannon. Firstly, Ultimate Weapons. These are, are basically just really, really, really stupid weapons someone thought up and then added to the game as a reward for beating it. We have the Giga Cannon, which is literally just a colossal gun that you get for beating the game. It is the size of a pipeline, and you just load massive shells into this thing and fire them. It one hits everything in a colossal radius of wherever you fired it. And if I remember correctly, if you're standing up against a wall or like right against the ground when you fire it, you can kill yourself, which is pretty entertaining. All right, next. Next up, the mass blade. It is not a blade, but oh God, is it massive? No, I, ha I, oh, oh, I have mass blade. Armor Red Core. Please. Please. <laughs> Please leave you typing that out in the video. <laughs> Please. I am begging you. It's so funny. Oh, here we go. This is perfect. This is perfect. Okay, hang on. Get, get Discord. No, Discord, get back. Okay. This is the mass blade. It's fucking glorious. What the fuck is that? <laughs> It's so it's good. Structural support beam. Yes, it is. It's literally right. just the. It's it's just a. It's a main structural support pillar from a skyscraper that they ripped out of it, fitted with jet boosters on the back, so you can swing it like a club. It is the funniest thing ever. It it one hits everything in melee. It's great, and you can do this weird like a hurricane attack with it, where you spin in a circle. It's fantastic. You can literally see the concrete and structural beams as well. It's great, and th these are all like joke weapons. Keep in mind, so they're hilariously oversized. This thing is like four times the size of the mech using it. It's it's so dumb. And the last one is the grind blade, which is neither a blade nor does it really grind thing so chainsaw fingers properly this time the, the correct one 
So that image where you see the, the six chainsaws, okay? Those, mm -hmm. the, e each one of those chainsaws is like the height of the mech wielding it. And they are on fire. They have like a plasma torch going. And all of them combine together in a super attack. Like you can swing it regularly like a giant fan and bisect enemy mechs into like 10 pieces. But it's got a special attack where it puts all of them together, spins them around like a Gatling gun, and then just YOLO charges at people with it. It's like an instant kill if you hit them. It's, it's so dumb. These weapons are also like really self-destructive. You carry them on the back of your mech, a lot of them, and you have to like charge up their energy systems to use them because otherwise it would be impossible. So it takes a while in each game to actually like charge them up in mission. However, when you use them, more often than, than not, they destroy parts of your mech. Like, the grind blade, if I remember correctly, destroyed the arm that it's on. Like, you, you have to, like, disconnect that arm and then hold it with your other mech arm while pulling this thing out. Otherwise, it would destroy it. It disables all the weapons and stuff on that arm for the rest of the mission as well, if you use it and it runs out of ammo or whatever. So, they, they are ridiculously overpowered. Second thing that I absolutely love. From the Fires of Rubicon trailer from Armored Core 6, the Pile Driver. I love this thing. I have to get you an image for it as well because it is honestly one of the coolest, coolest weapon concepts ever because it's just really dumb and simple. The giant dumb spike, and simple. You, you see the giant spike that's on the, the mech's left arm? Uh, yes. Yes. That is the greatest hole puncher ever. That so we're thing, just going jousting here. Absolutely. But but he, he, here's the thing, right? It ain't a regular type of jousting, right? It's, it's not like explosively powered. It has a colossal explosive at the back of it that fires this javelin dart forward into the enemy, coupled with like the most ridiculously over-the-top suspension system with those three prongs around it. Almost looks a little bit like a railgun, but it's not. In the actual trailer when it uses this, it runs up pokes an enemy mech in the chest, and a split second later eviscerates it and just destroys the entire torso. Reduced to atoms. Removed. It's great. I'm also, like, 90% sure that originally it was supposed to be blood staining the end of it because it punched through the actual core into where the pilot cockpit is. Uh-huh. Instead, it's all oil. I'm like 90% convinced it was blood originally, but to get around ratings, they were like, ah, we can't do that. That's not, that's not family friendly. That's not family friendly. Not like the rest of our game is, but anyway. <laughs> Everything is awful. Humanity lives in suffering. Corporate hellscape. Slavery is the natural order of things. But don't worry, there's no blood, so it's family friendly. Hell yeah. We love rating services. And, and finally... The last thing, the last really stupid weapon that I want to talk about is the Kojima Cannon. This thing is so stupid. So remember those Kojima particles, right? Yes. They were, um, they were basically the cause of a lot of things going horribly wrong, okay? Okay. Someone, someone decided, but by, by the way, they're also extremely difficult to control. Like, if you build, like, a containment unit for it, it's gonna melt the containment unit. They're, they're extremely difficult to use in any productive way whatsoever. So, of course, somebody mounted it onto a mech and decided that it would make an amazing energy weapon. I mean, it would. Anything that you look at with this gun dies. It, it just explodes. It, the, the wiki legitimately states that you will kill any target with one hit and it's very rare for any targets to survive a second. I want you to look at the face of this man and tell me if that's the face of Mercy. Tell me if that's the face of a man who gives a shit about the state of the world or would rather just watch it burn for shits and giggles. I, I think he's already watching it burn. Some sort of green for some reason, <laughs> but I think he's already watching it burn. Oh, uh, this is such a dopey picture. Like, it's great. I love it. And if, you know, to be honest, I don't even know if this actually is the guy, like, one of the devs that, like, designed that part. I don't even know if it's him, but it's a great image, so you know what? It gets to stay up. I'm That's so good. tired, by the way. I noticed. God, we've been going for an hour and 20 minutes. Holy shit. Yeah. I did. You already said that, and come on now. Pay attention. Uh, I'm suffering from a memory, a memory leak. Sorry about that. God damn, we've been going for an hour and 20 minutes. Holy shit. You motherfucker. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, that that is functionally the end of the episode. We have covered 
so many games munched into one another, but hopefully this has been a general overview of Armored Core that you can enjoy for people who know absolutely nothing about it and the general types of atmosphere and feel that you will be getting into and what the gameplay is sort of like in terms of the customization. Hopefully this has been relatively entertaining. Before we fully end off though, a big thanks to all of our patrons. Anything you'd like to say ahead of time, Steve, before I do the outro? Uh, shout out the OG David Gabe. I'm amazed that you remembered that. Bro, he's the first one, man. There was the one week that I didn't remember his name. I had a long week at work, all right? You let me out of the basement for a little bit. You know, I wasn't used to going back to work at that point yet. So so now that I'm back in the rhythm of staying in the basement, I can remember his name. And I told him all that right. I would. Shout out the man David Gabe. All right, fair enough. So, patron thanks. A huge thank you to all of our patrons, especially the food merchants feeding Steve. David Gabe... What the fuck did oh I just say? Oh my god. <laughs> Dave, David Gabe, the original. Augie, Eleven Bravo Crunchy, Terry Higgins, Pedro Munoz, David G, the other one, Silencer, and Vox Apollyon. Thank you very much for your support. I hope it will continue in the future. It is time to stop. Outros are very hard goodbye i i need to go to bed jesus so i take it that's a no to the war time tonight uh, no, i I'm, I'm i'm exhausted and i gotta get up early tomorrow so yeah let's go play video games why not i